The Causes and Cures of the Great Depression. My claim is the Great Depression was caused by the Federal Reserve action in the 1920s, and this created a great disequilibrium in the 1930s. My second claim is FDR, his fiscal policy, exacerbated and extended the Great Depression. So I have two claims. Monetary and fiscal policy caused and extended the Great Depression. And this is contrary to modern economic theory and policy today. So the chronology of the Great Depression was September 3rd, 1929, the stock market peaked. And it wasn't until 25 years later did it return to that level. In October, the stock market crashed. 1929, 650 bank failures. 1930, Hoover signed the Smoot Harley Tariff, which raised taxes. 1930s, the economy improved a little bit, but there was a ripple effect from the bank failures. 1930s saw a progressive increase in unemployment, Indust while industrial production continued to fall and bank failures continued. It's the claim that modern theory that it wasn't until Roosevelt's New Deal, revolutionary new programs, did the economy start to recover. It wasn't until in 1933 we ended the gold standard and we were able to provide more liquidity to the system through monetary spending. If that's the claim of modern policymakers and theorists, how come there was a depression within a depression in 1937 and 1938? Well, unemployment went up, went up to 19%, and then it actually went up to 20%. What you learned about the Great Depression and the claim of modern economic and policy is that wildcat speculation, this collapse of capitalism, this failure of capitalism during the 1920s caused the stock market crash. The little guy's consumer confidence fell and it wasn't until government through the economic policies of a fiscal stimulus of FDR and the New Deal were able to bring it back and correct the economy and stimulate aggregate demand. But this is completely wrong. It's based on the idea that why why is GDP equals C, consumption, plus investment, plus government spending? This identity equation is simply an equation in which you can turn dials, get a few Harvard PhDs in the room, and prop up the economy. If animal spirits cause and decreases consumption, the way to increase it is fiscal policy. But the fallacy here is when you take fiscal policy and build, let's say, a dam or a bridge or a road, you're drawing scarce resources from the private sector. Usually these civil engineers are already gainfully employed with specific skills, where the person unemployed is not going to be benefited. It will benefit a few, but not the many. And this exacerbates unemployment through fiscal policy. The Keynesian idea is they see the economy as an engine. All you have to do is, if it's, it starts to go slow or stalls, you give it a spark. Where that's not true, the economy is made of millions and millions of economic agents, you and me, individuals, making calculations about our budget, about business, about what we want to do with our lives. It's not an engine that to be started. There's the monetarist view that it was simply a decrease in the money supply that created the Great Depression. It's almost like they were just burning money, they were decreasing it, they were bringing it out. But that, that, that is, they weren't actually decreasing the money, people were withdrawing it from the banks. They were trying to make the market adjust. There was another notion that Hoover was a free market, laissez-faire president, and this is untrue. He was basically a precursor to FDR. And if you look at the data, the data shows that the deficit as a percentage of GDP increased under the Hoover administration. He built the Hoover Dam. So the evidence of my premise that fiscal policy extends the Great Depression is this. Between 1932, 1933, when Hoover and FDR started the fiscal policy, the Great Depression lasted another 10 years, or actually longer than 10 years. If fiscal policy helped, what would it look like without fiscal policy? Would the Great Depression last 50 years? Would we still be in the Great Depression? And these arguments have been made by people such as Robert Murphy, and Murray Rothbard. So they stand on fairly good foundations of economic theory. The second thing you want to look at is if the monetary and fiscal policy of the FDR administration helped alleviate the Great Depression in the 1930s, how would you explain the Great Depression of 1920? The first year was worse than the Great Depression in the 1930s. GDP fell by 24%, and un unemployment went from 4 to 12%. Industrial production dropped 21%. Woodrow Wilson, he had a stroke. His wife took over. There was not much going on in that administration. Warren G. Harding, he called for a return to a simpler life 
where you save, work hard, a life of austerity. He cut taxes, balanced the budget, increased the interest rates, decreased spending, did the opposite of the Keynesian playbook, and what happened? August 1921, the U.S. recovered and did well. Japan is another story. They continued the monetary and fiscal stimulus, and they stayed in their depression throughout the 1920s. There's an argument about the classic gold standard. The gold standard really caused it because there was not enough liquidity in the system. But during the classic gold standard, inflation was relatively low, 0.01%. 1789, $1 worth $1. 1913, the year the Federal Reserve was created, $1 worth $1.06. That same dollar is worth three cents today. And during the classic gold standard, growth rates were double of what they are today and downturns were short. So what happened was in the late 1920s, the U.S. violated the terms and the rules of the gold standard to bail out Great Britain because of the war, the First World War. And this actually caused the disruption in the monetary markets, not the gold standard. So what happened and what caused the Great Depression, it happened the night before. It didn't happen actually during the Hoover administration or FDR's administration. It's analogous to the Boston Red Sox having a big game and on St. Patrick's night, St. Patrick's Day night, they go out to every pub in Boston and drink green Irish beer, let's say. And the next day they have the big game. They're out till seven in the morning in the after hours club uh, for St. Patrick's Day celebrating. And the next day, the game, the game is already over. It doesn't matter if Hoover is pitching or Roosevelt is pitching or the Federal Reserve is on first base. The game is over because the destruction occurred during the 1920s. From the monetary base. So what we can say is great ideas are often forgotten. And the great idea specifically is Knut Vicksell, 1898. Besides having a very interesting sounding name, he looked kind of interesting. His idea was the natural rate of interest, the market equilibrating rate, as if money didn't exist where supply and demand would bring a market into equilibrium, was above the market rate of interest. The Federal Reserve pushed the market rate of interest so low, in today's speak it's the Fed funds rate, back then it was the reserve rate using the reserve ratio and the discount rate, it created a general disequilibrium. He was explaining price movements in the 1800s. This turned into a business cycle theory by Mises and Hayek. So let's look at this. The interest rate is a price. We'll say it's a price of money, at least a proxy is proxy credit. And there's another theory, obviously the Austrian theory of interest, Bombalvik which states that it's a time preference theory. But for this example, we're gonna be just saying that the interest rate is the price of money. It's a price, just like the price of tomato. If tomatoes are $100 a pound, nobody's gonna to buy tomatoes. If it's one cent a pound, no producers are gonna produce tomatoes. Prices convey information, intertemporal judgments about what consumers and suppliers need at a particular moment in time. And if the price is wrong, then people don't do business. And that's okay. The market of tomatoes will be in disequilibrium. But what if the price of money, the interest rate, is wrong? What happens? If the price of money is wrong, it has a systemic effect across all markets because money is the second half of every transaction. You buy your computer with money. You buy food with money. You buy clothing with money. You buy a car with money. The second half of every transaction, it's a barter exchange for money. And if the price of money is wrong, just like if the price of tomatoes is wrong, the money market is in disequilibrium. And when the money market is in disequilibrium, it has a systemic effect across all markets and creates a general disequilibrium. And that was the cause of the Great Depression. Mises and Hayek developed Vixell's theory. The fact that the interest rates are actually a relative rate, relative to the natural rate, causes a boom-bust cycle. And perhaps the most important point here that most theorists miss is that the business cycle is just not about the Federal Reserve. It's about the Federal Reserve uncoupled from the gold standard, from a commodity standard. Because it's the gold standard, under Vixell's theory, that anchored the natural rate to the market rate. So if the market rate drifted away, it would not be a long-term systemic effect. It would be a, a more of a short-term disruption. Many people say that deflation caused the Great Depression and deflation is to be feared. Actually, deflation is a positive thing. It means markets are adjusting. If the price of tomatoes is too expensive, the price comes down until the market adjusts. If the price of money is too expensive, then this needs to adjust. So in every market, it's about price, and deflation is a cure. If the price of labor, if the price of goods are too high, the price of real estate, the stock market, a deflation is the medicine that the market needs to correct. And the faster this happens, the faster the economy recovers, and we are on a healthier track. It's because money is in neutral, that Federal Reserve policy and fiscal policy disrupts the markets.
This non-neutrality of money creates a disruption. And not only that, it exacerbates the Gini coefficient so the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And you say, well, a little bit of monetary or fiscal policy may help. But how do we know it will help? Market adjustments are the cure. Deflation is the cure. Preventing deflation causes a distortion in the capital structure, increases the Gini coefficient. So any monetary policy or fiscal policy actually exacerbates the Gini coefficient where the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. This is because of the non-neutrality of money. There's always first receivers of money, whether it be the central bank creating money out of thin air and giving it to the bankers and not to the people, or fiscal policy where the, uh, the government creates a program where some benefit and others don't. Money is not neutral. Deflation is the cure. Letting the markets work is the cure. The cause of the Great Depression, this extension of it by monetary and fiscal policy, prevented the United States from going perhaps on a greater economic trajectory, where perhaps we'd have flying cars by now and we'd have colonies on Mars. There's even speculation that this Great Depression, it caused World War II. The economic upheaval, the chaos caused by the Great Depression, at least contributed to the Second World War. So the monetary and fiscal policy by the Federal Reserve and the government at the time during the 1930s, although well-intentioned, caused the Great Depression. Thank you very much.